One thing that I notice about this question as I dive in is that for number 12, the answer choices are very, very short. So on the one hand, that's kind of good. It means when I'm looking through these line references, I'm not really looking for a whole lot of information. There's kind of just like one idea that either is there or is not there. So let's sort through. I would still follow the QLC method here. Um, remember, this is our way of answering pretty much every reading question, and it keeps us organized, especially when we have these doubles. So it means I need to first read the question, the Q. Which choice does the author explicitly cite as an advantage of automobile travel in North America? Okay, so explicit means they're just going to say it. So that's good for us. That means it should be easy to spot. Now I go to the line references, though, and if you wanted to, you might be able to look at those answer choices first in this case and get a sense of what you're looking for. I, that kind of breaks the normal order of things, but because the choices are so short, I, I get why that might be doable here. But let's just go to the lines, okay? Let's let's do that the normal way here. Five to nine. Um, so that is here. Uh, choice A. Um, in other words, uh, traveling to work, school, or the market means being a strap hanger, somebody who by choice or necessity relies on public transport rather than a privately owned automobile. Well, it talks about cars, uh, but it doesn't say any advantage of automobile travel, right? It just describes someone who would be on public transit instead of having a car. It doesn't say why that's good or bad. Okay, so this just seems random to me. doesn't help. 20 to 24. Uh, that's here. And yet public transportation in many minds is the opposite of glamour, a squalid last resort for those with one too many impaired driving charges, too poor to afford insurance, or too decrepit to get behind the wheel of a car. Uh, so it kind of talks about cars, and it's mostly talking about public transit. Um, it's seeing a lot of bad things about public transit. Maybe that it means that there's some good things about cars. Um, the, I would keep this choice in. It seems kind of related, but to be honest, I don't really know what it's saying here. It's not, not saying anything explicit, which is what the question told me. So I'm not really sure, but let's let's see if we can find anything better. 24 to 26. Um, in much of North America, so that's a good sign, they are, they are right. Taking transit is a depressing experience. Okay, but that doesn't say anything about cars. So we can get rid of that choice pretty confidently here. It's not talking about cars, not saying anything about cars being better, it's just saying transit is depressing. Uh, 32 to 34, it's the end here. Um, um, hopping in a car almost always gets you to, you to your destination more quickly. Oh, okay, well that's a pretty clear advantage, like quickly. That's, you know, another word for speed. So there's your answer, right? I mean, it matches up pretty closely. And notice, I'm not going back to choice B, line reference B, to kind of understand that better. I, I very clearly found my match. I'm very confident in that. So I, I'm not going to second guess myself and reread a million things. Now, one piece here that's kind of important. Um, we want our line reference to support as many of the ideas in the original question as possible. So that's one of the challenges with these evidence pairs, right? Is everything needs to line up and, and there's just so much going on we lose track of some things sometimes. So let's double check that, right? So do they talk about an advantage of automobiles? Absolutely. We have the speed thing, pretty good. But there is this other piece about North America, and they didn't mention that in this line reference. They mentioned it in a previous one, but Ideally, I would want to have that mentioned here as well because you want to check off as many boxes from the question as you can. At the end of the day, you might just shrug and say, well, two out of three ain't bad. Let's just pick that. That seems right. And I'm fine with that reasoning. That's okay. Uh, but this is one of the reasons why the no reading strategy works because when we have these questions that have multiple line references, we often are sent two lines that give us answers to other questions or explain something that's useful for the question even though that line reference is wrong. So in this particular case, line uh, B, uh, sorry, line C, line C, the one we crossed out, this was a helper choice, a helper line reference. It was totally wrong. There was no way that we ever would have entertained it as an option. But it, it set me on the right track that, oh, we're talking about North America. And presumably, 
as we continue along the lines from C to D, and we skipped many of them, but it's a safe assumption that they are still talking about North America when we get to line reference D. So even though it's no longer mentioned explicitly in that line, it's a reasonable assumption that we're still talking about it because we just were three sentences earlier. And the, the line reference that we were directed to that talks about it was so bad for the purposes of answering the question. And yet it was so helpful for just giving us confidence in what ended up being the right answer. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. That's why I'm such a, a fan of the no reading strategy is test after test after test, I see stuff like this happen. And I trust that it is going to happen on every exam, that there will be bad line references that show us something helpful, that, that either helps on this question or at least gives us some more information for future questions, something about the main ideas. And so because of that, we don't need to read every single line. We're reading enough, even if it's a lot of bad lines, we're reading enough that's going to give us the big picture for the questions um, and the whole passage. So it's about confidence. It takes practice to get that level of confidence in how the test works. I wouldn't expect you to do that, but as someone who's been taking SATs for 15 years now, I think, you know, I know enough about what's coming that I can have that confidence and hopefully share it with you.